<laughs> All right. So um, for those of you who have to do the YouTube, before you start the class, read the assignment, have your comments, and then you'll be all ready to follow what the other students say, to write down your reactions, and then to finish up at the end. So once again, um, I want to remind you of that. I think that will help you a lot just to do it right, right then. Now, for today, uh, the articles are just data about climate change, but it's dated, some of it's older. And partly I give that to you because, so you can see the way that it's developed over time. And you can also understand how, how why there have been deniers and there continue to be deniers. And it's become a tradition in America and other places. And so you have to know sort of what you're up against and some sort of context. I do think it's going to change very quickly. And it's very, it's very possible that things will change radically and I won't need to have taught any of the things I've taught. <laughs> but I started teaching this decades ago to try and prevent the things that are happening. And um, for the most part, I didn't, but still just knowing the history that you're stepping into this river of history, that it is going to be a big, something big is gonna happen in your life. Um, I think China and the United States are going to get into this huge war, economic war, over green technology. Um, there will, there, you know, there are other wars, plenty of wars going on, wars for resources, but I think the ultimate war is going to be the economic one. And um, we shall see what happens. It's just that there's no reason America couldn't be way, way ahead. And we would be if we didn't have the horrible reactionary situation we have. And our Supreme Court is now going to, pat, going to um, make decisions that literally are gonna make it illegal to go green, right? So it's, it's just dumb fun. That's because of that John Locke theory of property. So our Supreme Court is obsessed about property rights. And so court cases are going to go to the Supreme Court. And no matter how obvious it is, they're going to decide for the corporations and the free enterprise and somebody's right to do with their land what they want. I mean... I'm sure it will change to some extent, but it will not change. Uh, it will, the, the resistance to change that's built into my country's legal system is really astounding. Um, and that's why I think China could take off and um, wipe the floor with us, even though we have had so much technology way before they did. But that's on us, right? That's our fault. Um, and your countries will buy the best product at the cheapest price, right? They're not, I think, I mean, I don't know. I think your countries might get torn, right? Between, uh, who knows? Germany might come up with some good green, uh, green tech. And I don't know why Saudi Arabia doesn't work on it more, um, but we shall see. Um, all right. I had you go find the, the issues in your country because I thought if you haven't done your research paper yet, something that you discovered, you might want to develop into your research paper or something somebody else says might trigger you to think, yeah, I, that's what I want to do. Or that's what I want to do in relation to my country. Or 
You could do it in relation to the region of Southeast Asia because it's not as if these problems are national, have national boundaries. Um, if you are from Myanmar, right? Myanmar is hard hit. If you wanna find out about the refugee camp in Southern Bangladesh, how they're gonna deal with climate change or how they are right now, that'll be, <laughs> That'll be a story, right, to watch. So there's lots of possibilities. Um, and as I always say, it's better to be informed and to just have strength of mind in the face of reality than it is to try to deny or dissipate or you know distract yourself. I think it's just important to keep it in perspective and just keep saying, yeah, but there's still something that I can do to contribute to um, culture and the promotion of humanity and sustainability. So you always just choose the thing you can do and let the rest go. So let me start by asking each of you either how you reacted to the readings and or what you chose, right? What issue you chose and what you discovered. Okay, so Mosa, what have you got? Professor, you are asking about the readings? Well, I, or and or what you brought, right? Yes, Professor, but uh, honestly, I couldn't go through the readings today. That's why I'm not able to say anything. That's, if did you bring something? Uh, no, professor. Yesterday I wanted to do what I could. That's okay. And so, and you didn't get to reading it yet. No, professor. I just uh, open it and I go through it. The what of the information and the uh, assignment you have given. It's okay. Could... Don't worry, Mosa. If if there's any point at which you want to make a contribution. You can raise your hand. Um, yeah, no, I know my students. I, I've been reading a lot of posts, okay, the last couple of days. I, once again, I want to assure you, I consider every student at AUW a hero, heroine, whatever you want to call it. I mean, all of you are very amazing, and you need to know that. And I am not going to intimidate you or there's nothing in the world I would uh, not want to do. I mean, I would not want to make you beat up on yourselves anymore, right? Than you do, because you all have to be telling yourself, I got to do this, I got to do that, or you wouldn't have succeeded to the point you have. But for, I just, again, want you to think of my class, you just pace yourself. And I'm not going to question you or criticize you or anything. I just want you to pace yourself. And um, I will try to pace myself too. Boy, there's a lot of stuff that's due that I don't know if it's all going to come in. If it does, it's going to be a mountain. But it's okay. We'll just all get through this, okay? Um, okay, so can I add something? Sure. For example, like, uh, as I already told you that I didn't go through the readings, but the assignment you have given, for example, the climate change, the data about my own country. So as I'm living in Bangladesh, so I did little research, not beat. So, so can I say something about my research, what I found? Of course. And then professor, so according to, uh, uh, you know, trust to these horses, I found that, you know, uh, in order to, um, uh, like, you know, uh, for, for climate change action, so Bangladesh has invested like more than 10, $10 billion. So, and for the, you know, uh, improving the capacity of communities to increase uh, for Bangladeshi, like, you know, um, as in, like, um, for example, like in Bangladesh, like, uh, stranding river embankments and postal folders and like also there are a lot of things like uh, 
like for example like due to climate change like economics development requires comparatively more resources and in by investment so in order to do that this also you know um uh for example like as bangladesh as a climate related catastrophes are um and also causing a shift in migration and poverty pattern in bangladesh so and uh, and also i i, I have found that like uh, for example like um in bangladesh the climate change uh, the most area is that you know uh, western coastal area and the north, northern coastal highlands and along the main rivers so it means that like uh, in the area which are you know very uh, near to river and the western and north uh, coastal areas these are very vulnerable to climate change because uh, uh for example if i'm talking about chitagon we have coastal areas and lot of ship and coming and going from abroad and then these you know contribute to climate change a lot and uh, in order to uh, stable to climate change bangladesh has you know as i already mentioned 10 billion dollar to improve this condition but still uh, in, it's on the process but i am changing rapidly because people are not aware of this so this is little bit data i had but professor i'm sorry i couldn't have much data okay <laughs> okay it's it's something um ramisha Hello, Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, I read the article, but not all the article. So I think uh, this article mainly discuss about the greenhouse effect and uh, how it impacts human beings and the, uh, nature. So uh, I got one point from that article. It has mentioned that uh, Due to the emission of uh, due to the emission of greenhouse gases, uh, global warming is increasing day by day. So it causes uh, melting of ice, and uh, finally, many islands and uh, coastal regions are already uh, threatened by changing sea levels. So I did some research about this point. So what I found is that. Uh, uh, the uh, most uh, dramatically impacted country was uh, ST Kids and Navis in the Ca Caribbean. And the uh, Ecuador came next. And also uh, Vietnam was third. So when it comes to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, because uh, Sri, Lanka is a, an, Sri Lanka is an island, so uh, I found some information about it also. Uh, sea level rise is... Uh, Another expected consequence of climate change in Sri Lanka's coastal zone in the 21st century. Uh, it has mentioned that uh, in the next 50 years, uh, sea level is expected to rise by about uh, 0.1 meter to 0.2 meter. So it causes 25% uh, of the uh, population reside in uh, vulnerable to sea level areas. Also, another article I was found that um, about the uh, carbon dioxide emission in Sri Lanka. So, uh, uh, 1960, uh, the emission of carbon dioxide was 0 0.229. Uh, when it comes to uh, 2018, uh, it was 0 0.998. So, there is in uh, it increased. So, and uh, yeah, that's it, Professor. Okay. Um, so when when they say fifty years into the future, right? Let's see. Yeah. That would be twenty seventy. Um, the way for you to think about it is that you will be my age. Okay, I'm fifty years older than you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good way to get a handle on it. And to say, you know what, it's not that long, right? It's, yes, Professor, yeah. <laughs> it's within grasp. Um, and so when I say I knew about this when I was 16, you know, if you just get some sort of, yeah, picture. And so the question for you is, right, how do you psychologically, you know, figure out how to live your life in the face of this? and to do what you can and to convince other people and 
at any stage in whatever your job is, you know, if you're a person that advocates, if you're a person that keeps the, coming to work with data to, so that you relieve people's fears and give them something concrete, right, to do. Because this is, this is going to be, you know, fear is going to be an issue. And yeah, so, yes, yeah, politicians can really make use of fear. And so in order to avoid authoritarian governments, I think alleviating fear is good, um, is, you know, a way to go. Um, all right. So I know Shazneen is also from Sri Lanka and she's kept up on this. So uh, I look forward to what she says, too. Also, <laughs> AUW students, you know, you can start getting together, you can form little whatever groups those are um, and keep each other informed about climate change if that's an issue. Um, it's just something to bind you together as friends. It's a kind of friendship group and it's certainly a good foundation for a friendship group. Um, so so um, that's, those are other things to do, how to stay positive, without being in denial. It's just form some friendships. Um, Anin, uh, Anin Dita? You, you said you got behind. Did you get anything done for today? Okay, Sauda. Hi, yes, professor. Uh, so from the reading, um, what I could gather, I mean, there's like, a, there was like multiple chapters or articles, whatever, I mean, I can call that. And it, so like, all of that was like, very, there was a lot of information, a lot of data. And in like, almost in every article, I would say, that there's like this common theme of all of uh, like all of the scientists, even like government agency, and like there was uh, even White House issued uh, reports that were like indicating and saying that the greenhouse emission is increasing, and uh, it's like uh, it's, it's good, yeah, and it's like it it's. it's already having a lot of neg negative impact on our environment and it's just only projected to continue to get worse but like, these are from it's not even that like the new information all of those reports it's all from like really long time ago 1990s 2001 like those are not that long ago and there's so many proofs, so many reports, and like it's from like what we considered uh, like world's most uh, reputable institutions or research centers, even from NASA. Like there's so many things, but like it's just data, proof after proof after proof, but there is no action. Like we had the Paris Agreement and everything, but even then, like even before Ob Obama, even before Trump, Obama, like during Bush, but there's like these data, these reports are from 2000. Like if I can, like the most, we can choose 2001. That's not that like long ago. And there's, there's from 90s, there's, reports from the 80s like reputable not from like a standalone uh scientist was like screaming into void no it's from like reputable institutions and it's like all it it seems like there's so many proof and there it's like everyone's just overlooking them and there is not me active it's just discussions and discussions after discussion but like no productive outcome, which was like really tiring to just read and see. I'm like, 
okay, there's, there was proof, there was this many data, but like, why wasn't there anything done? Like everything, it's like everyone was moving at this lot space. Like we are gonna just keep discussing and discussing and discussing, but there's like no action. So that was like the whole thing that I got from the readings, so just frustration. <laughs> Well, that's why I assigned you John Locke, right? Yeah. And the corruption of Locke. And more recently, that article, What Has Posterity Done for Me, right? That a rational person won't care about the future, right? Does that make sense, Soda? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at it without thinking about what they're thinking, you could say these people are totally irrational. But if you look at the intellectual history, that's the thing that I have to offer as a philosopher, that it would never occur to you. Otherwise, that people literally look you in the face and say, I'm doing what's rational, right? Because I'm maximizing the best means to my own economic self-interest. And if you don't do that, you're irrational. Soda, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what the Bush people, that's what the Republican Party actually does. And then they put it into our legal system. And yeah. it's just like, there's so many proofs after proof and there's like the majority of the scientific community majority of everybody is saying like giving us this many proofs so many reports so many data but all the like media and all the like, government or like this china uh us like the superpower whatever, <laughs> they are like presenting only the quite a few people who disagrees. And it's even ridiculous that they're disagreeing because they're against so many proof, so many literal, like proven theories and proven like examples. And like, it's just ridiculous to even argue against it. And there's like, in, and the governments and the medias, they're just focusing on the disagreement and they're just highlighting that. And, you know, I guess. Right, okay. Enterprises are just right. manipulating them, I guess. Look at it from the point of view of everybody's maximizing their economic self-interest, okay? So if the media presents it as controversial, they get more viewers and they make more money. If the if every one of those people who came out and spoke publicly that it's controversial or they denied it, got paid millions of bucks for doing that. People were millionaires. If you wanted to be a millionaire in the US, go get a master's degree in climate science and then go deny it. And you can get on the lecture circuit. And people will look you in the eye and say, that's success. Like that's an ingenious way to sell a product. That's a good businessman. Really, Soda, <laughs> that, that's what I want you to try to understand of how this society that claimed to be based on science, right? And data also had these views of life and culture and how to build a culture based on either science or rationality or something, right? I mean, they, there were different strains of it. And so now the utilitarians, right? The ones that are the data collectors are saying, no, this is gonna cause a lot of pain and unhappiness, you know, but that's in the future, right? And, you know, Jeremy Bentham would say, hey, we're just like herd animals. You can't tell a cow, you know, 
that they shouldn't do thus and so because 10 years from now, you know, their calf is going to be in trouble, right? So if you can't poke some pleasure button or some fear button, you can't get people to go along. So there was a time when I used to get these mailings from Greenpeace and all these places, and they had decided they were going to have to appeal to fear to get people serious, right? But then the other side, you know, figured out that they could appeal to, um, to pleasure, you know, dissipation. They just appeal to different emotions and they poked people another way. And so they had this little poking party. <laughs> and, you know, it comes down to that. And then you remember when um, Glenn Hedges wrote that thing about positive psychology and how America has been corrupted by greed. And so, and the people who were talking about it were talking in terms of utility, right? This will make more people happy over time, right? Positive psychology. Well, yeah, but you, you definitely are in climate denial if, if you're a positive psychologist, right? Because you don't, you know, that's kind of not positive. <laughs> so, so there's that. And um, that's what I sort of want to get you aware of. Um, because otherwise it's so shocking. If you just read it, you think, what the heck? This is, America is the science society? What happened? This is what happened. Um, then there are the geoengineering is a big deal in America. That would be Kant, right? The people who think in these absolute principles and they can use math and engineering, but they're not looking, you know, really at overall interruptions in the system or whether people will actually agree to this stuff or anything like that, right? Because Kant didn't think about contexts or, you know, anyway, I don't know, I could go on and on, but does that make some sense, Soda, when you, the difference, the disconnect between just reading this as if you picked it up yesterday and reading it in the context of the class? Yes, it's just like really sad to see, like, some like if a few people like a minority of people are just profiting and then they're just doing whatever they want and like suppressing the majority like majority of people is like will agree to the climate change issues and that agree that we should try to save our environment and planet. But how come like, it's just so <laughs> sad to think that the majority of people are just losing to this group of very minority of people. And we're- That's where, again, another thing I wanna point out, it is um, maybe 7% of Americans, the really, really rich, the fossil fuel billionaires, and then the Fox News people who literally say, well, there's an appetite for this, you know, people want it, and we need to sell the product, you know, and you have to please your customer. They literally say that, right? That's the way the system works. You're successful if you give people what they want. <laughs> and, um, so that's where the reason I read, I had you reading those religious positions is that, um, you know, I'm sure the, there is a higher percentage of Bangladeshis who accept climate change because they're experiencing it. And then the next yeah. question is, is religion going to help them? Because they understand arrogance, right? This is human arrogance and we're going to pay for it. And we really need to change because I don't want to go to hell. Or, oh, God will take care of it. 
it's God's plan. We don't have to do anything. So I'm not sure, but I did want to at least point out that religion isn't necessarily the bad guy. And the news makes it sound that way, I think. Does that make sense, Sauda? Yeah. I think the main problem is like most, it's just people are distracted. Majority of people are just, they have more like instant, like more recent problems that they need to put their energy into than think about 10 years ahead or their think about their grandchildren or like the future generation. They, they don't have, in, I won't say they don't have time. I'll just say they're just too distracted to even care about that far into the future. Well, until, and, until COVID, you know, COVID is this immediate threat, right? Yeah fear. And so they're much more afraid of the COVID situation or losing their jobs or not getting, you know, than they are about 10 years, 20 years. But before that, it was, it was pleasure, right? People were, you know, fantasizing about which makeup to use or, you know, when the next iPhone's coming, you know, so they were distracted by pleasure and fantasy and, and just ignoring stuff. Then all of a sudden COVID, and now they understand there are fears, right? There are threats. But again, neither one gets you focused on the most important problem. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. When I started teaching this a couple of years ago before COVID, I was surprised at how many students in these countries that are really hard hit were really we're into but you know buying lotions that make your skin bleach your skin or i mean they really were thinking about stuff like that and then they confessed to me that they were pretty embarrassed when they started finding out about climate change um i think maybe in this class the issue is that covid is so immediate that you're distracted from um thinking more long range that's possible uh, it's just sad because we never get around to the most important issue. Uh, but that that's, I just hope it changes. Um, Shazneen, what about you? What did you get? Are you there? Yes, Professor. Um, I had a few reactions on the reading itself, and then I'll go to what I have about my country. So, um, so when I read the first, like point A on the on the summary, um, you know the uh, the thing about average air temperature went up um, zero point six percent from nineteen hundred to two thousand. <clears throat> I know a lot of people might look at that and go, "Hey, that's not that bad," but um, I don't think people know like um, you know for for the average for the average um, global temperature to go up by that much, it's actually quite a lot. <clears throat> because um, a global cooling of three to four degrees Celsius, you know, brought on the last ice age. So, you know, a global warming of, you know, a few degrees Celsius could like, I don't know, <laughs> melt all the ice we have and like drown the entire, in like drown all the countries. Um, and then I was uh, like, in terms of, um, kind of political leaders, you know, calling it a hoax to win elections. In uh, when I compare that to my country, I think here um, what politicians do instead is promise to, um, you know, do something about it, and then they kind of forget once they're elected. Um, yeah, those are the main reactions I had about about the reading, and then uh, about. Sri Lanka, I found three prob major problems that I would like to um, talk a bit about. Um, so the first one is deforestation. Um, so as of 2000, like in the year 2000, 60% of Sri Lanka was um, natural forest cover, like primary forest. And then from uh, 2002 to 2020, Sri Lanka lost 
um, 10.2 kilo hectares. Um, for those of you who don't know, hectares is like 10,000 meter square of um, forest, I guess. So, so this is 10.2 kilo hectares. Um, and then in 2020 alone, we lost 11.2 kilo hectares of natural forest. So we lost more in 2020 um, compared to the last 18 years. Um, so in 2020, the 11.2 kilo hectares, that is an equivalent of 4.4 million tons of um, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, yeah, and then uh, uh, we still continue to lose uh, forest cover, um, mostly because the current government, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've used this phrase before. Um, I'm not sure within this class, but in other classes, um, people care more about trees when they're dead, like for economic value. Nobody at the moment is thinking about anything other than the economy. Um, so deforestation, that's one thing. And then I wanted to talk about um, the air pollution. So since um, 1960s, the population growth has actually kind of seen um, a decline. Um, there's still a growth of 0.6%, but um, so the most, uh, the, the most polluted um, air, if I can say that, yeah, is in Colombo. So the commercial capital and then Colombo has the highest population as well, like population density. Um, there is a lot of people who just travel to Colombo just um, for work. They don't necessarily live in Colombo, but, you know, it has the most amount of like motor vehicles and things like that. So, um, with COVID-19, like there were so many travel restrictions and curfews and lockdowns. Um, and most countries saw a decrease in air pollution, you know, because there were less vehicles. But Sri Lanka actually saw an increase in air pollution. Um, because, um, and then they explained it saying, you know, prevailing windy weather. And uh, they said it could be that due to the high levels of air pollution in India, you know, the wind, you know, blew it over to Sri Lanka. But I don't know exactly uh, if this is true, but then I was just, just doing a little bit of research. And in the year 2020, Sri Lanka had, um, so there's a list of like worst air quality in the world, like countries with worst air quality in the world. And Sri Lanka was number 30 on that list. Um, 30 or 16? Num uh, 30, number 30. I just want to mention, I don't know, it, this doesn't relate, but then I, I also noticed like Bangladesh was number one <laughs> on that list. Yeah. <laughs> um, lastly, I would like to talk about um, water pollution. This has been going on for like decades and decades. Um, in, you know, the, um, maybe not in 2000, but before that, like, in the ancient times, uh, um, Sri Lanka had like one of the best irrigation systems in the world. Um, I My dad always talks about how, you know, people from Japan, so this is like way back in the, um, you know, maybe during the King's time. Um, so my dad always talks about how people used to come you know, to Sri Lanka and say, oh, I want to be like this one day. This is when they were under the British rule. Um, so uh, yeah, there was a lot, you know, there was, we had one of the best irrigation systems in the world and everything, you know, the best sewage systems. Now everything is like, um, nobody uses anybody, like, so Ramesha will know this, like we have so many canals and everything and um, nobody uses it. Like it's not being used for irrigation. It's now just used as like the people around it just like dump waste into it. And there is no proper policies or regulations to like protect the canals from that. They're like boards that say do not litter, but nobody's like, you know, keeping an eye on it. The people who litter are not fine. So all the canals are now just 
very very disgusting it's like full of garbage um and then um i have talked about this before also in the class but about the burning of the um the ship the mx uh, the pearl ship uh so the govern sri lankan government they they know that they did something wrong like nobody they can't figure out who gave the captain of the ship permission to come into the you know sri lankan waters like there's a bit of funny business going on there they said that you know they may have deleted the email by mistake or something like that um but now like so hundreds and hundreds of sea animals are like like dead carcasses have been washed up on the shore i think for now 400 turtles and you have so many like dolphins and um sharks and all those you know animals being washed up on the shore and even now like even right now the politicians are completely like uh, they, so they they refuse to admit that you know it's their fault and like you know they so they still saying that there was no oil spill from the ship so the ship was carrying like i think so many thousands of cartons of uh, oil but they're saying that there was no oil spill and the animals are dying of natural causes yeah i think that's about it yeah yeah i mean can you imagine that would be called rational because that's in your self interest you're calculating your self interest and that's rational and philosophers worship reason right <laughs> okay how did that happen how did everything get turned upside down well there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom and a difference between rational and wise right and professor like um so this became a big issue in the country a few months back so the this school girl or oh, i don't know if it was a university student so she spoke up about the deforestation like so um the president ordered like a road to be built um you know cutting this really really important forest like it's our last uh, it's our last primary forest it's called singharaja you know it's a, it's a world heritage site you know very rich the biodiversity so there's a road um you know supposed to be built um you know running through it and somebody like this girl spoke up about it and she was arrested like almost immediately and yeah well is it it's scary you can't talk about um you can't talk against those things um in public so she spoke to like a school audience or something like that is it if it's a world heritage site can they cut roads through it um they they don't care i don't know they they can't technically oh boy yeah okay so the un can't monitor that stuff um i, I guess they do but then like so they even submitted a report and stuff and then um i remember like the in, on the news um they were saying that the government chooses to um disregard that report the un report they okay. don't accept it okay all right shazmima Are you there, Shamima? Yeah. Yes, Prabhata. I thought Shamima, you are calling someone. Actually, Professor, I didn't go over all the reading, so I just want to talk about what I understood and by comparing in my country. I went like in the reading as I found like. about the greenhouse effect and how it affect to the people to the people like when like in myanmar it was large scale in a study people every day experience of the climate change in one article as i found in myanmar have received wide spread change weather over last over last decade many people like many people Like fill in temperature arise and half spring fall has increased. It also like it affect in environmental change 
because you know professor like in Myanmar, it was like vulnerable destructive like earthquakes cyclones and floodings landslides are common during in the raining season like for example in 2015 it was like a big flooding which like we never like even in my grandparents they never ever saw like this kind of the flooding during this time like many people died because of the like affecting the landslide and also in the monsoon season like we have to aware like about the flooding and the landslide and many because this time we people like face so many problems. It was like the common in the raining season. Okay, do you have deforestation and that makes it even worse because there used to be forests? Sorry, Professor. Do you have, I mean, when people cut trees down, then do you have even bigger landslides because there's no forest there to keep the mud, keep the- Actually, 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 Professor, we are living like in the in rural area, so it not happen like, for example, we have the separate like, hope you may heard about the Yangon, but we were living in Yakai State, where we have like a lot of, we are still like nearly to the mountain, where we people like cut the trees and like those things. So it is a problem that people cut the trees? It's not a big, like the big problem. Like many people said, like the area is so like in the lower, like the dams low. So it happened that frequently about the flooding. Okay, okay. All right. Um, does the government do anything about it? Professor, like it happened, for example, government did, we have to prepare like from the TV channel and everywhere we should aware it like the rainy season, if high rainy season happen, we should aware and like this time, you know, Professor, it become everywhere, everywhere, like we just staying in home and sometimes the water was like inside of our house and we were going somewhere and government took us somewhere in the like in safety place after two or three days then we can come it was like that it happened the frequently professor like in the month season does um does the government claim to be doing something about it and they're not doing something about it Professor, during this time, the government was like trying to protect to the people. After that, they didn't do anything and just wearing you should rebuild your house like they strongly and like those kind of things they just did. Okay. Um, does the government um, have contracts with businesses to cut down? forests in the in the flatter areas professor you know as i saw like in as i read many article about the deforestation like if someone cut the tree they give like some kind of the punishment like they just doing in the like the government but in our country you know professor especially in our rural area like it was so expensive because of that, the people are like, government did, but sometimes they don't like care because they want to sell, they want to earn money. Like this kind of thing, it happens. Does the, do the government officials take bribes? If people want to cut down trees, can they pay the government officials and they'll not say anything? No, Professor, the, if they found like, they, like those kind of thing, then they will get the punishment, but the people are doing the privately. Okay, all and right. Even if, if they want to sell like this kind of the wood, they like, they go somewhere, they didn't sell like in our, like in our area, they went another area to sell like those kind of thing. Okay, all right. Um, Shristi. 
Yes, Professor. Did you find something? Yes. Um, okay, uh, so like the increasing water level is one of the big problems in Bangladesh uh, for climate change, I think. And I have found that Bangladesh has ranked seventh on the 2020 Global Climate Risk Index. And like for many Bangladeshis, particularly the rural communities, in coastal areas, those risks are already unmanageable. A river bank erosion displaced 50,000 to 200,000 people here each year. So I think the most of the people who are at heavy risk already live under the poverty line and the elites are contributing more into destroying the environment for them. Like for example, um, there are people who rely on handouts like um, dry flattened rice and bath in the Puriganga River that used to be known as the mighty river of Bangladesh is now like one of the most polluted rivers in Bangladesh, which serves a dumping ground for the chemical industrial waste and human waste. So it looks like the elites are really contributing to the country's economy and their own businesses by encouraging the climate change and putting millions of lives in danger. But the irony is they are also the one of those elites who give donations to the NGOs for saving poor. So I'm, uh, that's... Are there a lot of NGOs related to these kind of issues in Bangladesh? Uh, they're like not very big NGOs, but like small. And the main is the United Nations. Okay. Is the UN very involved? Uh, Kind of, yes. Okay. I know that Bangladesh has a lot of UN soldiers that they give, you know. Yes, but they go to other countries to right. it's uh, just a, war. I mean, it's just a question of whether there's a payback in some, you know, some other way, right? We'll give you soldiers if you give us, you know, some sustainability. Um, yes. Right, technology. But or... also, Professor, I have found one thing like, despite like this, there's a quote like Bangladesh has been suffering a lot from this um, water level, sea levels, and other climate change issues. But Bangladesh had ranked sixth on the 2018th global climate risk, and now they are seventh. So I couldn't understand the difference like how this is possible if Bangladesh is um, uh, increasing in the terms of climate change problems then they should be ranked higher well actually probably all the top 10 are increasing it's just one of them was increasing at a higher rate oh yeah yeah I would imagine that that's the problem um okay well that's good to know. Um, Jamie? Okay, is Jamie there? Uh, Rossi, what do you have? So for me, I look into the air pollution level. So the air pollution level in Siem Reap on July 3rd, 2021, the air quality index was at 25 US HUI. So US HUI, it is a like a standard of measurement for air uh, quality and 25 means that the air quality in my hometown is satisfactory and air pollution poses little to no threats. However, air pollution in Phnom Penh was at 53 US HUI, which means that it is moderate. And for um, those who are sensitive to air pollution, it poses health risk to them. And this is nowhere near Bangladesh because Bangladesh is, Bangladesh has a air quality index of 162 US HUI, which placed it as the number one country with the worst air quality in 2020. And this is in the unhealthy range that can cause serious health effects. And after finding about this, I am actually a bit concerned because 
I live in a place where the air quality is pretty good. So my body has to adapt to the changes when I go to Bangladesh. And so I don't know whether my body will be able to adapt well to it. And also because of the coronavirus affecting our respiratory system with the air quality that bad, it just makes things worse. And it makes our bodies prone to diseases like the coronavirus too. Okay, so um, I, I think actually, all right. So when I came there, uh, I got sick in Indonesia. Um, yeah, and so I should have checked the air quality, but nobody was wearing masks and nobody was talking about it. And I did have an attack, okay? Did I say this before? In Indonesia, I coughed for three weeks before I started having these. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I couldn't breathe. And sometimes I just wasn't breathing at all. And so I had to get fly home in emergency. But what I told myself is as soon as I start coughing, you know, I'm going to go in emergency, you know, I'm going to get a air purifier, stay inside, wear a mask, whatever. But this time, it only took one event, right? And I was pretty seriously, I mean, not as bad, but it really kicked in fast. So then I found out that Chittagong was a number 80 on the scale. Dhaka is a number 200. And so 80 is not something it says if you're particularly sensitive. So I would advise, you know, the students, they should still come to AUW, but I think they should wear masks and they should, you know, be aware that, that it could be an issue. That's all. I don't think it should prevent them from coming. And I also think as soon as they get the new campus out in the countryside, the air quality is going to be a lot better, right? Does that make sense? Um, but I'm going to, my goal when I get back to campus is to pretty much have an air purifier, stay in my apartment. If I can get an office with a closed door, I'll have an air purifier. And because I, you know, I want to be able to come back. Um, but, you know, I think the school should just let students know and then have masks available things like that, just precautionary. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Raihana. Oh, did I call on you before? No. Are you there, Raihana? I, I guess not, okay. So it's six minutes after the hour and I'm going to, I, oh, you're there, Raihana? You wanna speak now? My mic isn't working, okay. Another thing you could do, if you are from Bangladesh, you might wanna try a different country because obviously we have three students. Um, let's see, who is this? Um, let's see, oh, okay. So Anindita said that she recently wrote a paper on waste management of biomedical waste. Um, so in Chittagong, the COVID uh, biomedical waste is not being properly managed. Um, of course, we have to, we can imagine what that would mean. Um, so Sauda says, um, she says, I think we, and I think it means um, Bangladesh, um, we're a bit lower in risk because we're good at coping, right? Because everything, you know, is thrown at, at us. So you might be better at um, resilience, like psychological resilience. Um, but it doesn't really lower the actual factual risk. It just lowers the risk of people going crazy <laughs> or people being unable to cope. 
Sauda. Yeah, that was just Professor in response to uh, Shristi's question. So that we went from six to seven. So I guess like as things are increasing because we are so used to it, I guess the countries that are not used to it and they're getting like, they're not as good at coping as us. So they're, they're suffering more. So that's why I guess we just went one step lower. Right, it could be because like if the ocean goes up and then one country happens to have a whole lot of land that just that year went underwater, right? Because, yeah. So it might be just based on this purely physical stuff. Um, so what number is Sri Lanka on that list of uh, countries, you know, suffering? Did you say what number Sri Lanka is on the list? Uh, anyway, I, I can imagine Southeast Asia has a whole lot of uh, countries that are pretty high on the list, but there's a lot of countries. Let's see. Uh, Sri Sti, the monsoon, the Dhaka is always underwater. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Pike, I just want to add what Sri said. It's very similar to in Cambodia too, because a lot of the natural water absorbents like lakes and stuff were being filled up and so to business owners. So like when it rains and when the monsoon season comes, the water doesn't have a place to go. So it just floods the whole city and then like it takes weeks, if not months for the water to slowly drain out into like the sewage system. And then that water push the sewage and waste into the Mekong River. And then it ended up in the Tun Sap Lake. And so it's just people creating a whole lot of health concerns for themselves. Yeah, actually, it's unsustainable to put it mildly, right? Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm going to give you, I have 11 minutes after the hour. And so I'll give you till 25 minutes after the hour. Does that sound good? Yes. Um, Dr. Beck, uh, this is not related to class. Uh, I did send you a an email reminder. I know you're a bit busy, but did you get a chance to read it? Yes, I did read it. And actually, I... I was reading a lot of stuff today, and I don't know why I didn't put yours first, but... No, no it's, it's okay. I know you're busy. Do it right after class, um, because yeah. why not? You know, I can do that. I don't think it's going to be a problem, but I'll read it over. Um, I read a lot of papers in my uh, philosophical psychology class. And that's what made me, you know, uh, well, my students just inspire me because they were writing a letter to a friend or a letter to themselves in 10 years or something about uh, the virtues and how to be resilient in difficult times. And yeah, I mean, the students at AUW just, just are for the most part. So I, I want to keep reminding you of that because sometimes some little thing will happen and you start getting all upset. But in general, you're all really, really doing well and really hanging in there. So that's what I want to remind you of. <laughs> okay, so let me stop talking and you all can take a break and um, we'll get back. Anybody not talk the first round? Did I miss anybody? Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
course not. I Let me turn on the machine and, and explain that again. So Mosa had a good question. Like she says, is that every other professor does it that way? Or is it standard or? Okay, so in my paper grade worksheet, I have, you know, the thesis and I have, is it clear? Is it important? I have some criteria, right? Yes. And then I have sort of what I used to do when I did it by hand is I would put a, a box sort of on a continuum because it has excellent, okay, not good enough. And so I would sort of put a, back, a box on the continuum there. So then it would be a little more obvious. But, and then I have, you know, all these criteria. So the students who are listening to the, to the video, um, right now I don't have it listed that the percent. Um, I do, let's see, I had one student, you know, uh, write a paper and her English normally is just not good enough to do an, to get an A, but I gave her an A minus because she had a lot of good quotes, you know, that her ideas and the organization was good. The English was um, a struggle for her. And so I, I, you can get an A minus, but for the most part, it, I just don't like to graduate students with, you know, transcripts that say A, and then the employer or the graduate school finds out that they cannot write good English, right? right. So, um, so I, I try to push that quite a bit. I have some students that have improved their English a lot this semester, um, which I really appreciate because for your sake, right, I, I do try to, to emphasize and, and actually, you know, punish it a little bit. The trouble is some students come with way more advantage in English than others. So I try not to punish it too much. Um, yeah, I find professor. And professor, the thing is that they're just starting their journey, right? They have more years to follow. That would be fine. Okay, so we can go over. We let me go over the paper. That's something I think I should do. That was a good, um, a good recommendation, especially for you know students are listening on YouTube and. Uh, it is getting to that point in the class where it's all about getting those papers in and all that stuff. So um, where is that rubric? Uh, and I should have sent it more recently again. That's a perfectly legitimate uh, request. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here's where there was a paper coming due right about here. Um, there we go. All right. So let's just look at this. Um, uh, okay. So today, for the readings today, one reason, you know, that was probably a little confusing about how to react to the readings was that didn't really have a thesis. They're just a list. It's just a bunch of information for the most part. Um, and if they're trying to prove something like um, people are denying climate change or something, I mean, that's you can sort of figure that out yourself. It's not, it's not problematic. So a thesis has to be something that you have, you have read things and thought about things and you've come up with a point of view that requires an argument. You know, it's not self-evident. Um, and so that would, you know, that's a thesis. A topic is something like climate change. A thesis is something like, um, given the world's situation, um, the, the the irony of the global economic system is that in order to face climate change, 
the people who have the most power to do it are the ones who whose cultural orientation gives them the least reward and are the least likelihood of of doing it you know and so then you then you would argue about these ways of thinking and all that stuff but the point is it's something you have to prove and so so having a, a topic would be climate change a thesis would be the people who really could do something are not inclined to do it because of their culture and then you have to start proving it um so the quality of the thesis that you understand the course material and you're able to analyze it. And it's an important thesis, right? It's not trivial. Um, and then the arguments. So, so you have premises and conclusion. So the premises and then you're drawing an inference. Um, so some of those premises are facts or they're um, reasonable assumptions. Or, and they're, or they're based on the facts or they're uncontroversial or they're what the authorities in the field accept, right? So they're legitimate premises. Um, and then you draw an inference, a conclusion. It's logical. You supported your conclusion. It's convincing. It's clear. And the parts all fit a whole, right? So then in your argument, you say, I'm going to prove this um, starting with this and then this and then this. And all three together are needed to prove my conclusion, right? And so then you start with um, one part and that leads to the next part and that leads to the next part. And together, they adequately support the conclusion. Um, Oh, give an example. Let's just say um, Mackenzie Scott is a is an enlightened philanthropist. Not only is she generous, but she's enlightened, and she her philanthropy is oriented toward the future um, rather than toward her ego gratification or something like that. And so then you say, first of all, you have to find out, well, what does she give to? And then you have to say, well, you could find out what sort of research does she do to find out who to give to or who does she talk to? And then you say, um, what are her decisions? And then you say, how much does she give to them? Or what qualifications does she put on her philanthropy? Right? And so there's a lot of steps in the argument, right? First of all, she, um, she consults with people who are forward-looking. Second of all, she um, prioritizes according to, she prioritizes sustainability first. I don't know if this is true, right? <laughs> and women's issues, and some of these issues that are really going to become huge in the future. So she's, she's, um, she's working with progressives. She's picked the major issues for, the, for making for a better future and the percentage of money, the amount of money she gives to each of these and then the qualifications that she puts on the money she gives. So all those together would prove the thesis that she is contributing in a way that is most likely to create a better future. Does that make sense to you guys? As a, I mean, I just made it up off the top of my head, but it's, it's that kind of a thing that you're thinking about what you want to prove. You've got to think about, you know, all the different aspects of the problem and then how they fit together. So I, you know, the way I presented them was sort of chronologically um, from whole to part. Um, all right. So textual references, yes, you need six. Um, direct or indirect references. And in this case, um, they have to be scholarly articles, peer-reviewed articles. Um, I don't 
did I say six? No, I said three, three. So please don't look at six. These are, you know, I, I don't change these every single time for every class. So it'd be three. Um, you can quote them directly or indirectly. Um, it shows that you understood the, the um, article you read. It's long enough so that you can see the connection, but it's not too long. Sometimes students get caught up in their examples and you lose the train of the argument. Um, they explain the connection. Okay, for example, you know, Mackenzie Scott, uh, one of the organizations she, one of the people she talked to was um, Melinda Gates. Melinda Gates has always been very much into women's empowerment. So uh, because the future, you know, women need to get educated because it affects uh, population control, it affects whether kids get education for sustainability. So she contacted Melinda um, and then it would be irrelevant for her, for you to say something like they become best friends and they go to places together, right? Uh, uh, that, that's off topic, right? They, you know, just, she is in touch with Melinda Gates. They both agree on the importance of women, blah, blah, something like that. Um, so don't make it too long. Uh, explain the connection, don't get distracted. And then you incorporate it into the paper. Um, sometimes a student will say, um, oh, let's see. Um, well, I guess I'll try to keep with my same example, although this is just off the top of my head. So I'm getting a little nervous about this. Um, Let's see, well, she starts talking about Melinda and she have a friendship. That would be uh, no connection there. Or um, Mackenzie is interested, is very progressive in her philanthropy. Um, uh, Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan, the Sri Lankan government uh, is working on women's empowerment or something it's you have to you have to incorporate it right she consulted with them and they said that this specific program is what they're looking at something like that you can't just have she's interested in it and so is the sri lankan government it was like yeah but you didn't explain to me what that connection is. So that, that's what I'm getting at. Um, your examples, you come up with some examples. So the text references could be examples. That's what I was just giving, but it could be um, something like, um, Mr. Heilbrunner talks about rationality and you have this whole section about scholars agree that this is an I this is the model for rationality and economists agree on this. Well, that's not yet giving an example. And then you say, for example, uh, when somebody tries to inform these people about what's going on, they have no interest. And here Mr. Heilbrunner said, blah, 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 right? So there's Textual references can be used to support that there is this idea, but then examples, you know, you have to, the next step is to show that people are actually living according to those ideas. So that would be the difference there. Then you give a counter argument. Um, sometimes, uh, okay, so, I guess I'll just keep going with um, climate change. Um, the counter argument would be that COVID has made people so afraid and it's so immediate that they just can't pay attention to the long term, right? Or um, developing countries have to just do what they need to do, and the developed countries are going to have to really set the stage 
And if they create green technology, they can sell it to developing countries cheaply and developing countries will definitely buy it. It's not like they want to pollute. It's just that they don't have the means to do so. So the counter argument would be something like, um, uh, so you're arguing that the developed countries have to step up and, and do it. Well, the counter argument would be, well, but the developing countries could at least have an educational system where the children get educated so that when the products start coming in, they will actually be amenable to behaving this way. Um, something like that, right? So you have to have some kind of skeptic, some kind of person who's throwing a wrench in your argument, and then you can respond to them. Um, and then you organize your paragraphs. So um, each paragraph has a topic. Um, so Mackenzie Scott is a progressive. Okay, one paragraph on her contact with the Gates Foundation. Maybe that would be, you have enough points to make for one paragraph. Next paragraph, she, um, she contacts the, the boots on the ground, the people running these institutions and the way that she works with them there and the way that she finds out uh, she doesn't just throw money at them, right? She asks, what do you need the money for? Um, what sort of accountability, what sort of um, accounting practices do you have? Um, and then also follow up, like she expects to see some results. Um, so the institutions have to write in write reports every five years. I'm sure this is true of AUW, incidentally, with the World Bank. So um, this is, you know, teaching at AUW, it's kind of on my mind. Um, but anyway, so you, I think you could probably have a paragraph for each one and make sure that you have a topic sentence. I think some English professors think, you know, it's more sophisticated not to put the topic sentence on the first paragraph. But as far as I'm concerned, like it could be just like a glorified list. You could just have the first sentence be the point and then you follow up on it, the second sentence, so that I could actually read all the first sentences and really have your outline. Uh, I prefer that. Uh, I apologize to the English teachers who might think that's kind of clunky and, and not very you know, artistic, but <laughs> that's me. Um, we're all a little different. And then is this being recorded? You guys? Yes? Okay. Yeah. I see I can't see that. So thank you. Um, and then the grammar. So I, um, I'll try to correct the grammar. And as I said, I'll try not to dock too much, um, but I do want you to take it seriously. So your grade will be lower, um, but again, I don't wanna keep punishing students that didn't have the same advantage backgrounds. It's, it's somewhere in between there. Then the quality of the paper. So technically, <laughs> up to this point should be like the bare minimum, like a B or B minus. I'm, I'm kind of an easy grader, but I do wanna be able to at least tell you when you, why didn't I get an A? Well, okay, I can sort of hammer that to you. Students usually don't accept it anyway, but here's what would make it an A, right? That your thesis is complex, and it's complete, you actually support everything and it's creative, right? It's something other than what's obvious. So, you know, if you have a paper on climate change as a serious issue, you know, that's fine, but it, <laughs> it's not hard to prove and it's not very complex and it's not very creative, but you know, you could probably write a good solid B minus paper on that and move along. Um, does it apply? Is it significant? 
So I think every topic we discuss in this class is pretty significant. But I've had students write papers that you know that they're just checking it off the check sheet. They don't really care. And I, I don't like it when students play games like that, play academic games. You know, I've had students that are smart. They know how to write papers. They can sort of whip them off. And I don't want to come to the end of your paper and say, who cares? Okay. Um, and then these things, um, I won't weigh that much. This is related to lion, but they're things for you to think about. And it's very possible that without you even realizing it, you are actually doing a lot of this. But the um, liberally educated person at Lion in the catalog, there's a list of the qualities, character traits. One of them is intellectual honesty. So, you know, to say that I'm not going to do anything about climate change because I believe that God is going to take care of it. I don't think that's intellectually honest. And I, I think... Do you think God thinks, okay, it's okay to destroy the creation or to watch other people suffer and not do anything about it? It's not intellectually honest to, to blame God or put it in God's hands or ignore what you can see for the sake of something you know nothing about. And you were given this gift of being able to reason. <laughs> And if you believe in God, God gave it to you, you're supposed to use it. So it's not intellectually honest to do that. Um, commitment to truth. Um, in other words, you don't just go saying it's morally relative. Everybody has a different opinion. Um, that you really can draw inferences. You can accumulate data. You're fair to opposing points of view. You're patient with complexity and ambiguity, and you tolerate a decent counter argument, right? If the other person has reasons, then that's, um, that's you can tolerate that. Um, so the complexity and ambiguity in the case of climate change might be about how are we going to solve it? Because it's very complex. And so then, if your paper includes, is about a practical suggestion or includes practical suggestion, then you have to acknowledge, you know, the complexity and the ambiguity. But you can also say at a certain point, it's not that complex or ambiguous, but there are parts of it that are. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, in most of my classes at Lyon, there, everything has to do with an idea of flourishing, right? That, that we should act in ways that, as far as we know, promote human flourishing, right? We, can, we feel like we're flourishing when we're doing something that actually helps other people flourish in this particular way. But that also could be, and some of my students at AUW, it's also related to their idea of God or their faith their Buddhist tradition, Hindu tradition, Islam, Christianity. For other students, it's just humanism. Um, some of them are atheist humanists, you know, flat out. So, so, um, so that's, those are all the things I look for. And I've read tens of thousands of papers over the years. So, you know, I think I'm kind of, uh, taught myself stuff, um, but I haven't ever put a percentage on it. And so I do want to ask any of you if that makes you more nervous that I didn't put a percentage on it. It just seems like I wouldn't be intellectually honest if I tried to do that. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, teacher. Yes, professor. Okay. And Professor, one more question. Go ahead. So for this paper, do you need to write it down and then send it to it from mail? 
because you have not uploaded it through, you know, in Google Classroom. Oh, I should put it on Google Classroom. I thought I just did, but uh, I will post it on Google Classroom for sure. Okay, Professor, thank you. I, I thought Rossi pointed that out to me and I did it actually, but maybe not. Um, uh, okay, thanks for pointing that out. Let's see, um, any other questions about the papers? Because then we'll go back to the reading for today. Um, all right. Okay, well, let me, um, okay, let me go back to the syllabus so we can look at the, um, how all of these assignments, how that stuff comes together, um, how everything's linked to everything else. So we are talking about the paradigm shift from ancient cultures to uh, modern, industrial science, science and industry, and now to post-colonial, um, and how now we're dealing with this, right? The effect of colonization on the, on the cultures that you're in, on the institutions and the laws, and then how when your countries became independent, have they been able to um, move forward, but, is global capitalism truly just another form of colonialism, except it's whitewashed with this appearance that each of you is living in a, an independent democratic society, but actually your leaders, are they really slaves of the international capitalist system? And they just in the end have to do what rich people say, or, are they infighting with each other? And really um, the problem is that they can't accept dissent and they can't just take turns ruling and being ruled in turn. They have to um, keep um, demonizing the other person to get votes or discrediting an election. I mean, this is happening in my country. So, you know, I'm. I wouldn't be able to be critical of it, but um, each of you has to sort of analyze your own country if your leaders are actually doing the best they can do or if they really are sketchy. I, in my country, I think the Democrats do the best they can do and still get elected. And they're these Democrats that just want them to do, you know, based on what really is best, but then they'll just lose an election, that's all. So Biden is not doing nearly enough for the environment, for a green infrastructure bill. But if he tries to, or if um, the, there's a couple House representative or Senate people, if they vote for it, then it will be a Republican next time and the Republicans will take over the Congress. So, so each of you has to decide in your own country, is the ruler, are the rulers actually doing the best possible? Um, or are they really um, using the system for their own advantage? But it's, it's clear that there is a kind of economic colonialism that's getting whitewashed as freedom uh, and democracy. So, so we're studying how that happened. We're studying how it happened in fact, and then in the way people think. All right, so how did people think? Well, so we have John Locke's view of rationality, and that's a key. And the next reading we're gonna do is on economics. And we're gonna run into this again, big time. Uh, but we've already run into it, right? With what has posterity done for me? I shouldn't have to calculate that. Um, let's see. Then there's Kant, and that's the bioengineering. And so 
that's come into one of the readings is that's one approach. And that would be a person who is thinks like Kant, thinks in principles, thinks in mathematics and abstractions. And um, their, their views of how to apply all of that um, can vary quite a bit in terms of whether they accept climate change or not. There's a lot of engineers in my country who are actually fundamentalist Christians. <laughs> so people can be pretty highly sophisticated in certain left-brained um, skills and still uh, emotionally and culturally and in terms of climate change, they can be all over the map. They can be, it's, it's sort of, Scary, but interesting. Um, all right. So then we had Kant. Then we had uh, Bentham, utilitarianism. And I talked about that, right? Which pleasure, pain, and happiness, right? How immediate. And Bentham especially, it was much more, we're just like herd animals. You got to treat us in a way that physically affects us or we don't change our behavior. So that would mean climate change would have to get so bad that people would be starving or they wouldn't have water. I mean, it has to get really bad before people will do anything about it. Um, and that's a pretty sad state. Um, then Mill talks about that freedom of speech, all that wonderful free society, but that's only for mature adults. Well, <laughs> who gets to decide who's mature? And, um, and he also thought you could take your kid out of your house if you're not raising them correctly. So at this point, Mill would probably say, and Mill actually was thinking about sustainability long ago. A lot of people were thinking about it 250 years ago, actually. But he would definitely advocate taking kids out of a house unless you teach them about climate change, unless you raise them to limit consumption and limit carbon footprints. <laughs> and that, I don't think that'd go over really well because there's this other view of rationality. So this is, this to me is a touch point, right? This is why you have this scientific society that's destroying life on earth and people will look you in the eye and say, so what? Because the utilitarians split between Bentham and Mill and Bentham would hesitate uh, before taking kids out of the house just because you didn't raise them to be sustainable. <laughs> Whereas Mill would not. And the Bentham view or the Locke view has won out, definitely, because self-interest and capitalist interest and profits are what won the day. And um, so I do think you need to know about that. And then Karl Marx talks about capitalism, right? And so once again, you know, I've said this many times, but Every time you read this stuff, this stuff is sort of, the, these are the ghosts in the background. So Marx's view of international capitalism and what it does, it exploits natural resources and it always has to grow. It has to keep going. It exploits human resources. And, and we haven't stopped it. When the wall came down, and Marxism was proven to be wrong, or socialism was denigrated, you know, was exposed, and capitalism was proven to be best, it unleashed this lack of regulation. And, and that included regulations on carbon footprint. And that was huge, okay? There had been, under George H.W. Bush, if it weren't for one person, John Sununu, we would have gotten environmental laws in place. The Congress was ready to do it. All these people, and it was one person. The same thing happened 
with Mitch McConnell. I mean, just a very few people can really affect things. So, you know, I'm just hoping a very few people can also change them in the other direction. Um, but anyway, so keeping in mind Marx's critique of global capitalism is important because I think there are going to be more nonviolent uprisings among people that are labeled socialist or Marxist or even violent uprisings. If people start not having water or food, they're going to go back to Marx's manifesto and it's going to enlighten them. And, you know, it's going to be a, a way of thinking about what's going on around them. And the trouble with Marx is that he advocated, you know, his idea of the solution was not very good. But capitalism went right back to its worst dark side. And so it just seems to me we're going to have start having some dis, uh, unrest along these same lines. Um, Christianity. So then we also have this problem of religion. Is religion part of the problem or part of the solution? And you can argue it either way. Um, I as long as you understand, I definitely want you to understand whatever position you have, there are good reasons to have the opposite view, right? If you think the values, the basic values of every religion, which is condemns greed, uh, intellectual humility, um, avoid pride, don't make yourself into God, don't destroy the creation, don't create bad karma. I mean, that the basic values and the people who represented, who lived the life, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, would advocate for sustainability. But the way that religion is used as a political tool, the fear that people have, the desire to somehow make sense out of it, their lack of control, just like with COVID, can lead people to use religion to um, create, to make the problem a lot worse. So, um, but religion emerged from ancient societies and the ancient paradigm. So it, those people had to pay more attention to what the earth at the time, doesn't mean they didn't, exploit it, but they just didn't have the kind of control over it, the kind of arrogance that they've had in the modern world. And they, they didn't, well, anyway, you know. So that was that section. We skipped some stuff, but I did deep ecology, you know, that secular version of respect for the environment turns out to favor, again, it becomes another kind of colonialism. and. The readings for today show you that that colonial mindset and that uh, Western modern rationality mindset is still at work, even in people who think that they're totally outside of that mindset, right? The, the deep ecologists, still, when it comes to actually boots on the ground, figuring out what to do, the first thing they do is push peasants off the land and create wilderness preservation, rather than recognize that peasants have sustainable farming techniques. And the, in, uh, it's, it's called indigenous knowledge at this point. So the first thing to do wouldn't be immediately to push them off. Um, it would be to, to gain that knowledge and figure out how to integrate it with more contemporary knowledge. Uh, but anyway, so that's just another chapter in colonialism. Um, biodiversity, clearly the problems are there, right? Um, over the tragedy of the commons. So now we have these problems, right? And so now 
what sort of mindsets are we bringing to these problems? And the fact that, that we can't overgraze, right? And um, lifeboat ethics, right? And we went through that lifeboat ethics and the way people are reasoning. Again, Mr. Garrett Harden is rational, right? Protecting your own self-interest, you know? Don't let those other people in the lifeboat or all sink. Um, we have to protect the future, blah, blah. So it's, it's very self-interested. It's very Western, it's very privileged, um, and it's too simplistic. So the critique of lifeboat ethics just says it's too simplistic. It appears to be compelling, but it's not. That isn't the way it's gonna happen. And the way that I think of that is the geopolitical types, um, the bioengineering type of people, they can create this fantasy of a geodesic dome, for example. Buck, Buckminster Fuller had this geodesic dome where people just live in this huge bubble and it, can, it has glass. It's like a greenhouse, except that you can control the climate, right? And so these bioengineers, I can imagine, well, some of them are flying to Mars to set up something in Mars. That's a total fantasy, but it makes them a lot of money. <laughs> but let's try something on Earth, right? Uh, geodesic dome. Well, um, they, what they don't realize is that poor people are not going to sit there and watch as this thing gets built and all the rich folk, you know, move in. <laughs> like, they're not gonna just sit there, right? They're gonna destroy the machines. They're gonna knock it down. They're not gonna let that happen. There'll be a war. I mean, there will be soldiers and killings and massacres and all sorts of stuff. But for the rich to think that they could get away with it just because they have enough money, is, is crazy, except that I somehow think there are rich people who actually think that uh, because they're not dealing with reality and rich people can live in a fantasy world and they can think that they're a lot more powerful than they are and that they control, can control violence against them. And I, I think we've come to the end of that. They need to know they can't. Um, so the next, um, so let me just see, again, explain where we're going. Next time we're going just to plain old economic systems. And again, I've cut out a lot. Um, I assign economic myths and global realities. So um, we're gonna talk about capitalism and then we're gonna talk about not the racism, I didn't assign that, about the myth of catch-up development for Westerners sort of sell you on, you know, just go ahead and it'll all work out well for you. And it won't. <laughs> and then I have some articles about uh, advertising, global advertising, and then um, excerpts from dysfunctional society where he's talking about the we're, we're addicted to uh, climate um, fossil fuels and we act like addicts. And, you know, so he compares the dysfunction within family systems or the dysfunction of drug addicts with the way that we function as a, as a culture. And then another article I have is the effect on women. Because again, this is an all women's school and it's about the effect of this on women around the world. So that's another, so I did change things up a little from the um, original, but the, I, the general idea is that um, everything we've read is interconnected. Um, now, when it comes to something like animal rights, right? <laughs> that within the context of climate change and within the context of these much bigger ideas, it's 
it's it's relatively trivial, right? If animals are dying because they have no water to drink, <laughs> you know, whether they have rights or not is not going to be a big deal. But there will be people who have decided that's where they want to do their work. That's what they want people to focus on. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. I have one more question. What? I have one more question. Go ahead. Which is professors uh, like, except the research paper, which is we need secondary sources is three, right? The scholar, scholarly articles, but uh, if I'm talking about the post four, 14, which is about the data climate change on countries. So uh, how, like, is there I know, any requirement to add any like secondary or like data? I mean, references? Well, How many? No, actually, all I wanted you to do, yeah, not for just a, a daily post, right? I didn't want you to, to um, have to do some serious research on that. I just posted a lot of things because it was a lot of different ways you could go, just so you know that there's so much stuff out there. And then- no, I'm, I'm asking that professor because no, like, you know, like for example, the reference thing, how many reference should we add? Not mentioning, that's what I'm asking. I'm not talking about research paper, I'm talking about the post 14, the climate change thing. For post 14, all I wanted you to do, do was go to some site similar to some of these sites and just get some information about your country. That's it. No. So no limitation of references. You, I mean, you would have to, to cite, you know, tell me where you got the information, but. No, I'm asking that, for example, like for final research, sorry. For the research paper, we need to add three references from yes. scholarly articles, right? Yes. Yes. I'm asking for um, post 14, there is no limitation, right? So how many uh, references should we add? As much as we can, we can add, right? Right, just at least one, that's all. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. Chris. That's all. Um, all right, so, let me see which one of these I would want to start with. Okay. The, all right. Let me see what I, I outlined. I, I emphasized a few things in this article that, that I thought might be, you know, there's just all Bangladesh is referred to. I suppose you probably noticed that. But again, that was a long time ago. Um, okay, so anthropogenic, right? That was a big issue for a long time. Um, in 2004, the vice presidential candidate in the Republican Party claimed that climate change, well, the Republicans, first of all, they denied it. And then they said, oh, it's sunspots, okay? <laughs> they really, they, they have done everything. Um, and now they don't even talk about it at the moment. But um, Mr. Trump appointed somebody to a climate panel, right? And that guy is not a scientist. And he's made a ton of money giving public talks. And so a journalist uh, went undercover as somebody who ran a an organization and they wanted to have this guy talk about, you know, his denial of climate change. And the guy says, you need to contact my agent, right? And so this guy is making millions of bucks. And yeah, he's Trump's choice. And he would throw a wrench in anything, you know, anybody else on the panel would say. So there's that. I mean, that's and, you know, what I'm worried about is what I've noticed is that 
people in developing countries imitate the U the US, right? They see what George W. Bush was doing after 9-11, and they do exactly the same thing. And so it's, you know, for me to mention this stuff is just to let you know that there's a lot of other political leaders that are aware of this. Here's another one, uh, mitigation member. <laughs> okay, uh, step needs to be taken. Um, okay, uh, about how to mitigate it. Well, there's, um, there's the question of who should pay the most. It should be the developing countries. Um, and then there's an argument about how much we should prevent and how much we should just adapt, right? Well, here's other um, issues that I know people are debating, capitalists. How do we make the most money? And they would. They would say, can I make more money on a mitigation product that I can sell, you know, either to a gullible public or to politicians who want a whitewash or whatever? Or should we just say, yeah, we should let climate change happen. And then all these capitalist entrepreneurs will think of all these cool products and they'll sell them to us and everybody will be saved and they will make billions of bucks. Right? There are people who think like that too, and they're rational, right? They're calculating the most efficient means of their economic self interest. Um, I hate to tell you that, but I do know this stuff for better or worse, which is actually worse. But that's when you read an article and it just talks like that. Well, there's mitigation and there's adapt. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, <laughs> but the capitalists are calculating which one is going to make the most money for me. Then there's the geoengineering. And again, um, I think, did I assign you an article where there was, I guess not, but there are articles about food programs where um, developing countries were making themselves look good by giving food to the poor, but, but the capitalists were making tons of money and it's not necessarily the best solution to just give people food. Well, this is the same thing, right? Um, people can you know, make it look like they care, but their first motive is money. And so it isn't necessarily the best way to go. Uh, then there's geoengineering, there's managing the sun, and then there's uh, removing carbon dioxide again. Are you gonna get all, all these sketchy companies that create products that they don't necessarily prove are legit, but political leaders, um, they contribute to the political campaigns of, of politicians who then give government money to develop these kinds of geoengineering. Um, so the journalists, you know, are working hard to keep up with this. Now, the other thing, though, that it said was that um, during the Bush administration, um, there was there would be all these interviews on the news about M MSNBC as well as Fox News would always have the contrarian. And the article says that it gave the impression, like if you had one contrarian and one scientist, that it's 50-50. And he said, no, you know, it's like even at that time, you'd have to have 40 scientists for one contrarian in terms of the, the proportionality of how the results were coming out. Now it's like nobody denies it anymore or that it's human caused. The only people who deny it are not scientists at all and they're making a ton of money. Um, all right, so public, okay. Then the people who live in the developing countries, even though they're the most educated, 
they're the most skeptical percentage wise. And the people who live in the developing countries who are the most affected, even though on average they have fewer educated citizens, it's a higher percentage that accept climate change. Um, all right. Oh yeah, then there's the problem of if a scientist decides to um, come out, you know, and just say it's a problem and, you know, it's time to act, then they get accused of not being objective anymore <laughs> because there's, there's this standard of the detached observer and I'll give you an example of that. I was working with an economist from Bangladesh, and he was doing surveys about of Bangladeshi people in rural areas or something. And it was about something like whether they want to have a plant built in their town or something like that. But they never ever told the people about the pollution. <laughs> right? Because they're being detached observers, you know, if they told them about the overall effects environment, that would be biased. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, but that's how it works. I mean, there are economists who claim that only a detached observer. So, you know, I don't make judgments about whether, you know, my products affect on the environment because like, I'm a businessman, you know, I sell stuff. And just like Fox News, right? I don't make judgments about whether what my commentators are saying is true or not, or the overall effect on democracy. I, I'm just a business person and I know what the people want and I sell them what they want, right? So I'm just an economist taking a survey about whether people would like a Pepsi Cola plant um, in their town, and I don't, you know, I just ask their opinion, and they say yes or no, and I don't mention that it'll make jobs, and I don't mention that it'll lower the water table and pollute the water either, because I'm totally detached, so that's how, that's how crazy it is, um, and that's how crazy the educational system is, that I think you know, a lot of students talk about the difference between liberal arts education and in your societies, a lot of people are oriented towards science and medicine in particular, but you know, it's not necessarily environmental science. It's not the science they learn doesn't necessarily ever relate to issues about human caused climate change. Um, that's considered a subfield and it's not been very popular because nobody can make any money off of it. And that's a detached observer or that's, I don't know. Um, let's see. All right, so on page 613, he talks about um, let me see what page we're on. Uh, okay. Talks about the mass media tries to be fair and balanced, and it's not. And then that most of the people who disagree are not even scientists. Um, yeah, most contrarians are not even scientists at all, right? He didn't even include how much money they make. But... Okay, and then if scientists jump into the fray and start saying, making claims, um, okay, then they get right here, they get accused of losing their objectivity and politicizing their science. Yeah. Um, so I did have, um, yeah, corporations, Exxon Mobil. Oh, another big tactic was that ExxonMobil um, told, told, they hired a whole lot of 
uh, professional advertisers. And they told them to sell doubt, right? So about climate change, to consider doubt like a consumer product. You're, so you're selling doubt. And so just plant this seed of doubt in your, you know, through your advertising campaign. And um, it worked because the students I've had at Lyon College for 25 years, they, they doubt, right? They keep saying, oh, well, it's not certain. And um, that was the result of a very expensive, costly advertising campaign, just like you'd have any other advertising campaign. Um, so that's the way capitalism sort of eats up. Um, all right, let's see. This one. Mm, okay. I, he talks about the notion of uncertainty and the fact that if we what if we put, you know, 50 million tons of carbon in the air 50 years ago, it had a very different effect than if we put it in now, because it's called synchronistic effects, which again is common sense, but you can't prove it with the kind of certainty you can prove um, in a lab and in a, you know, in a much more controlled situation. So that's always a problem. Um, the Bush administration just ignored things. We have a long history of the Republican Party benefiting economically and um, ignoring climate change. So I just hope you know, that developing countries will catch on. And there was really no, no effort. A 2% reduction in the US economy would have made a huge difference. Um, all right. Yeah, all right. I, I, I guess you all can read this stuff. Um, there, these are the diff disagreements that people have now and um, the different treaties that have been signed. People, but it's just gonna happen more often. There are gonna be summits uh, coming more and more often because the situation is gonna be more and more obvious. This is another site. So this was just the thing. I put these sites on here so that you had, you know, you could just pick a bunch of stuff. Um, and this one is just to show that there really isn't any meaningful disagreement. Um, this one is another summary of what's going on. Um, this one, the Heartland Institute is, if you are hired by them, you're hired to be against climate change as if it's something to believe in. Um, I remember going to their webpage and the person right up front, the spokesperson was a lawyer. He wasn't a scientist, which, you know, they can't do any better than that. Why would that be compelling? Because obviously his law practice is, uh, you know, based on anti- uh, climate change laws, you know, and making money for companies that sue for not being able to use more fossil fuels, right? Being held back by a government, the companies will sue. And um, so it was kind of obvious that this is bogus, but there's plenty of people that will give money to it fossil fuel billionaires, and um, they spread misinformation. So if, if any of you wanted to write your papers about some of these misinformation organizations and who's funding them, Charles Koch, there's a whole Koch political machine 
Um, I don't know if you're interested in that. It's not pleasant. Um, but, you know, if you like to, and here's the, the chart. And um, I, I think <laughs> that the thing about, the other thing about it is that where I moved to Minnesota might end up being twice as cold. That's what they're predicting because the, the way the whole system works is that there is a warming trend in the wind and that won't happen. And so the Northern hemisphere will start getting super, super cold. So, uh, yeah, you guys might be better off than we are, but it's still an outrage, right? It's not. And this is another Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. There's an organization called 360, which is a lot of young people. It's more recent, I can send you. I get their notices every week or twice a week about what they're doing. So if anybody has interest, I'll probably forward it. And if you wanted to stay on their mailing list, but um, mostly you just have to find what you can do and you don't have to get tons of information. I mean, another big problem with climate change is that our brains can only process so much information, especially when we have these phones, we're already set up to be processing tons of information. And so just to add, this other layer of information isn't necessarily giving us a very good way to figure out how to live in a way that's sustainable. I don't, I don't really think most of us need more information. We just need a life plan and a way to think about it so that we can minimize our own and be activists when it's appropriate. Um, but I don't, I don't think you have to keep getting more information. You could drive yourself nuts. Um, so Jamie, did you want to comment? Because I didn't hear from you before. I guess I've lost most of the students. Maybe I was droning on and, and boring. I understand that's very possible. <laughs> um, Part of it is, again, students who've gotten behind maybe can sort of this keep summarizing, keep reminding themselves of how it fits together. Um, so does anybody else have any last comments? Did any of this surprise you? Are there any parts of it that you think are most important? Were you aware of the misinformation campaigns or things like that? Um, Mosa, do you have a takeaway? Or Jamie? Or Sristi? Thank you. Sure. Did you have some comment? At the beginning of the class or anything? Okay. Um, oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. So actually, Mosa said she could get disconnected because it's raining. Um, Sristi, did you have any last comments? No, that Professor, actually, not now. Okay. And then Sauda, did you have any last comments? Uh, about today's class, Professor? Just climate change in general or what we covered today. Uh, yeah, okay, so I've been like in and out of class today quite a few times. So I, I guess my connection isn't so stable today. <laughs> That's why I, I wasn't sure what to say. Okay. I, mean, I just got 
I think because there's so few students that have actually had a connection all the way through the class that, you know, just about everyone's probably going to have to go back over the YouTube. So, yeah. All right, with you, I, I'll shut it down now. You know, it's 35 minutes earlier so that students can just, you know, tackle it on their own. Does that um, make Professor, I will include my further comments in the post. I'm writing it right now, actually. Okay, I do, I would like you if you can in any way um, finish the post now, but I, it just seems like. Sriesti might be the only one that that's actually been able to stay connected for the whole time. So um, anyway, at least I want to shorten it up a bit so that students don't feel too overwhelmed. You do not need to listen to the whole thing. Um, you just need to think about think about it. What's useful to you? What did you already read? You don't need Professor Beck to repeating it to repeat it. Um, whatever it is, so that I, so that you yourself, you're just thinking, what's my takeaway? What piece in the in the puzzle is this? How does this fit into the class? That's it, and then move on. So, okay, I'll let you go, guys. Uh, thank you, Professor.